Well, as we move into the Scripture today, uh, there is one of my favorite Scriptures. It is Philippians, and it speaks about how God emptied Himself and became a human. Uh, the Scripture that I prepared it from is a little bit different from this. You know that we read translations of the Bible, uh, depending on which translation you read. Uh, I don't think we have Greek scholars here this morning, so we're going with translations. Uh, one of the translations says, to have the attitude of Christ, to which I wrote my sermon title from, to have the attitude. Uh, unfortunately, with English, the language changes. It's a living language as we go. And whenever you tell somebody these days, you have an attitude, we usually only mean one kind of attitude with that, don't we, these days? Or we even shorten it, we drop the at out of it, and we go, you got a tood, right? Is You've heard this? Okay, okay. So uh, that's not the kind of attitude I'm referring to. It is having the mind of Christ, having the mind of God, which is very different. We're going to explore that in the Scripture today. And as well, we have the traditional reading, one of the traditional readings for Palm Sunday. Well, let's gather ourselves together and start with Philippians, the second chapter, the fifth verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, glory of the God the Father. And from the book of Mark, the 11th chapter. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, and untied and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say to them, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, Why are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed him to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. This past week, Patrick Walker asked me a question. He said, is that something new Methodists do, that particular prayer? And I, and I didn't want to admit to him, I said, as Methodist preachers, we get together every once in a while and we see somebody who does something, and if it looks pretty good to us, we use it. I had to admit to him, my original prayer when I first became a preacher was different. My original prayer, which I didn't say out loud, I would pray before I came in. I'm like, God, you called me to be a preacher. You've called me to preach today. It would be really good if you showed up now. That, that doesn't sound quite as good, does it? Uh, but it is the same prayer in my heart. God, it'd be really good if you showed up right now. As I read this scripture, there is the word Jerusalem, city, the city of Jerusalem. 
a line on a hill, as Jesus called it, but it is two words mashed together. One of them is to throw out or to gather up. They use it as the same word, to shoot out arrows or to gather and pile up stones. That's the first half of Jerusalem. The second half is shalom, which you guys know as the word peace. It is a place that peace is gathered together or that peace is thrown out. It is stacked up together, yet the name of the city doesn't really reflect the history of one of the oldest cities in civilization. It's been demolished to the ground twice, sieged 52 times, attacked 44, taken over. Uh, you just look at the history of it. Uh, the word peace doesn't come to mind. There are three major religions that are there, Judaism, Christianity, and Muslims all live in the same area together, and occasionally they don't all get along. Uh, surprisingly enough, some of the people who have the most trouble getting along are their Christians with other Christians. We'll leave it there today. It's a rough neighborhood. There are battles going on all the time. And when Jesus rode in on a cult that day, Amanda pointed out something very important. They came and they were waving palm branches. Now, these are a national symbol for Jerusalem, for uh, Israel. This is a national symbol. So just imagine this. They're all waving a national symbol. A man is riding in on a colt, which is saying that he is a victorious king and is coming to take over. And everybody in the back of their mind has their own agenda with what this means. Can you imagine that in today's politics? Uh, can you imagine that we occasionally elect people because we think they're going to do what we want them to do? Uh, we were driving to church this morning and there were signs for different mayors all around Crockett. Uh, Y'all have seen these, haven't you? And, and my wife mentioned it to me and she suggested she didn't know what everybody's agenda was behind it. Uh, I said, well, rest assured there is one. Rest assured there is one. Uh, I, we, she began singing that song, sign, signs, everywhere a sign. I said, and some of us, I, I, I added a chorus, and some of the things we put on those signs we might actually do. Uh, there is this idea that as these people were waving this, they were all in favor of Jesus in the triumphant entry when Jesus was going to carry their water of what they wanted. But when he wasn't going to, they put it down and they nailed him on a cross. Because it was their will more than God's will. Jesus says, in coming this week, judgment will be poured out. You, you know the, the saying, you give them enough rope to hang themselves. They came and they wanted their own way so badly, and we want our way so badly that we'll vote for a rebel named Barabbas before we'll vote for an innocent man so that we can have our own way. Or maybe that's just me. But that's the story. And judgment is poured out. Uh, the story in Genesis is we rebelled against God and so sin rolled in. And when Jesus comes and sin rolls in and we again rebel from God. And I then ask this question, how could Jesus have any peace in the middle of of all of this. A man rides in on a donkey. He is the prince of peace, and he is riding into a scene that makes the children's sermon look like play today. I, I just want y'all to really understand. I really thought that, I think that's really wonderful to see all the children all doing their own things while the message is going on. Because that's more of the church than you might know. Uh, one time uh, a person said to me, uh, Patrick, well, I just don't like organized religion. And I said, well, we're not as organized as you might suspect. <laughs> yeah, y'all are getting it now. <laughs> you see, somewhere in the deepest, dark places of our heart, we all have our own agenda with God. We all want our God to show up. Are we willing to deal with the God who is God? Or do we want to rebel? You see, that's the question. If, if we want to follow the Prince of Peace, if we want peace in our life, there is one God that we can follow, and He is Jesus. And He rides in on that day, and what He does 
is he lays down his life. Now, you may not have considered this. Uh, my wife has considered it several times. We talked about it. I said, how is it that Jesus could have any peace and care for any of those people who are waving palm branches that he knew were going to nail him on a cross by the end of the week? I don't, I don't know about you, but if I knew you were going to do that to me, I wouldn't be really nice. Uh, peace would not be on my mind, but yet Jesus had peace on his mind. And the question is, how? We have to turn to the Philippians passage. And in that Philippians passage, what do we find? That being God, he didn't hold to that being equal, but he left that and became a human. And then he moved from being a human to being a servant, and then even being a servant willing to die. Here, I, uh, let me make the connection for you. It's God's character to serve. It's God's character to serve and to serve those that don't even love him. I hope that speaks to you. I, that is where Jesus had peace, was in this place of he was knowing that he was going to serve. And in, in finding that peace, that is the road to peace. Uh, if you've not known peace in your life, if you're like me, after the alarm clock goes off, I know peace right about before the alarm clock. And then the alarm clock goes off and the day starts. Anybody else living this life? And there is all kinds of things going on. There's all these agendas. There's all these things we need to do. And we need God on our side as opposed to getting on God's side. You got that right. We need God on our side. We're not as interested in getting on God's side. And so I find it interesting that when I get on God's side, I have peace in my heart. I have peace in my life. This past week, uh, I've spent uh, from Tuesday through Saturday afternoon sitting on the board of ordained ministry where we sit and we interview other pastors to see if they can become pastors. And in interviewing, then we begin to listen to them. Now, I, I want you all to know something about it, it is a privilege for me to be on that board, but I do remember sitting on the other side being asked those questions. So I have mercy in my soul when these people are coming and we're ordaining them, we're, we're asking them these questions. And one of the things we have to do is learn to listen and go, are these people pastors? I, I found in listening, the more I listen, the more I hear. And it is amazing some of the things that I hear and some of what I would call the things that people have in their mind that they're not even, they don't even know they're in there. Uh, they tell you things they're not even aware of. And one of the things that was an assumption, and it was a wonderful story that comes from Tuesday, was we had somebody who was changing tracks. They were moving from being uh, an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church to an ordained elder. Now, these are two different sets of orders. Uh, it, it's very different from many churches that you may know, but an ordained elder is what I am, which means I can do all of the sacraments, uh, I order the church, I preach, and I also serve. Now, a deacon does service and preaching. So the question came, are, are you ready to make this transition? And did God call you to it? Now, one of the other things that's interesting about being an ordained elder is we live under something called itinerancy, which is a fancy word for the bishop calls and you go. Uh, back in the day, way back uh, a long time ago, the last day of annual conference, they would read the names of the pastors and the churches they had been assigned to, and until that moment, you didn't know where you were working. Now, I just want you to picture this for a moment. Do you think the pastors stayed to the last moment of that meeting? They showed up. Uh, so one of the questions we had, are you okay with the itinerancy, and are you sure that God has called you? And something that came out of this person's mouth that I don't even think they realized was this assumption that pastors are above other people in their abilities, their gifts, and their holiness, and they have their life together. I just want you to picture that for a moment. That, that is the assumption she had in her mind. I, I've got to tell you something. The, the longer I've traveled with God, the more I realize the less I got it together. I, I find that an interesting assumption, that the, the closer we are to God, the more we have it together, well, the more we have it together and the less we realize that we do all at the same time. Well, what was funny about that, one of, my, one of my friends was pouring a Coke, and as he's talking to me, he's pouring it, it had the lid set out to the side. The lid fell over, the Coke poured over the top, it ran all over the table, and I said, thank you for doing that. 
because that makes me feel much better about being me. Anybody else have this kind of life where you do silly, you walk in and you like hit your funny bone, uh, you sit in a chair, it breaks. Is this just me? My life, the assumption that because I'm an ordained elder, my life is more together is a bad assumption. Here's the real assumption is to be called to be ordained is to call to love people and serve them. It's to have the attitude of Christ. And so what we look for is, do you have peace in your life? And are you called to love and serve people? And are you willing to do that? She enunciated that very clearly. It was an amazing moment. Well, one of the other things we did, that was early in the week. Uh, early in the week, we have what we would call the people moving up to be fully ordained. Uh, by the end of the week, we're moving on to what we would call local licensed pastors and certified lay speakers. Those are the people that serve smaller churches. Uh, they're very important in East Texas. Half our churches worship less than 50 people. Many of them are supplied by local licensed pastors who have full-time other jobs. Some of them driving 75 to 100 miles one way to go preach at a small church. Does the idea of service come to you at that moment? And some of them go and preach at two, three, and four churches on Sunday morning. Uh, these people are a privilege to interview. Uh, Kathy went with me, and she did part of the interviewing as well. Kathy Calvert, I know you're here somewhere. Anyway, uh, she was willing to come and serve and sit with a child who wasn't willing to behave for a moment. That is a church family uh, where we come and we come alongside each other. But Kathy and we were interviewing, and one of the one of the men had an incredibly humble spirit. An incredibly humble spirit. Uh, he was a local licensed pastor. He'd been serving one church six years, another church about three, three years. And his full-time job, full-time job, was being at a school, the supervisor of maintenance. As I talked to him, I said, well, how's it going with your church? Well, it's going okay. It was, it was kind of like pulling teeth, trying to get this guy to... Tell me how it's all going. Well, as he began to speak about his church, he said, well, when I took over, our church was filled with people 70 and up. And we've graduated a few of those people on. But he said, our attendance has continued to grow. He said, we've had new younger families coming. And he said, and we've had children come to the church for the first time ever in 10 years. We now have children regularly in church. And I said, well, how did that go? He said, well, everybody didn't like it at first. He said, you know, some of the old people took me aside and said, uh, we're not so sure about this, Pastor. Uh, and he said, after a few years and the children being in worship, he said, now if the children miss, the people ask, well, where are they? We miss the children. Uh, what had happened is, is the church had grown, and I, and I said, you've grown these two churches, you have new people coming, you're out in the middle of nowhere, how'd you do it? There's a reason I want to know. <laughs> yeah, somebody's getting that one. <laughs> that, you, you know, uh, it's not because I need you to brag, it's because I'm ready to steal something other than a prayer. And what I came to the conclusion of is the more I interviewed him, what I found was, it was because he was authentically humble. He was authentically a servant. He was authentically inviting people. And when everything didn't go well in church, he listened. When everything didn't go well, he said, it's okay, you can tell me about it and we'll work it out together. What, what, what I found was, here was a man who knew the Prince of Peace, who lived the way of peace. It's a wonderful thing to have that humility, the willingness to not consider yourself better, to consider yourself worth all that. My, my prayer for you in this Holy Week, my, my hope for you is may you know the peace May you know the peace of Christ that comes through humility and serving.
a world that may not love you for it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.